Rachel Madel from Talking With Tech. And I'm Chris Bouguet from Talking With Tech. We have a podcast dedicated to augmentative and alternative communication, all things related to helping kids with complex communication needs. If you have a passion for helping people with language disabilities, this is the show for you. Each episode features an interview or a roundtable discussion on a topic related to augmentative communication and helping people with language disabilities. And we're really passionate about giving practical strategies to clinicians working in the field who are working with children or adults, anything related to AAC. So you can look us up on iTunes or you can find us on Facebook. We've got a group over there or check out our website at bit.ly slash TWT podcast. Please join our community of professionals that are working to ensure that everyone can say whatever they want to say, however they want to say it. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas, or thoughts, or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science Episode 82. Proud members of the Exceptional Podcast Network. We want to make sure you find all of them. So head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. That'll link you directly to all of our network friends at XPN. I'm Matt Hot, joined as always by my favorite person in Philadelphia, Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? Michael, how is Philadelphia? Philadelphia is great. It's starting to get real sunny around here. Uh, people are, uh, I've been doing a couple of sessions uh, outside in, in the community, which has been Ooh. nice. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for summer. I'm a, I'm a summer guy. And speaking of Philadelphia, did you see my favorite Philadelphian, Will Smith in Aladdin yet? Have you seen that? I did not. Um, yeah. I didn't really hear anything about it either. So what? It's not bad. I liked it. Not you bad. You have seen it? I want to see it. I, I have seen it. It is, uh, it is the cartoon come to life. So, so it's good. So it's good. I like it. And my favorite bourbon SLP who can do therapy on a horse, Michelle Wintering. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. I will not be on a horse doing therapy, but... <laughs> Come on! I still want that moment where you ride up Wyatt Earp style to someone's therapy setting I have to and facilitate jump it. The kid or the patient could be on the horse, but okay, I would love well, to ride works. into a therapy session, though. That'd that works. So how have you been this past week? I'm doing well, um, enjoying the sunshine and checking out the local pool as well. So speaking of, is baby speech science going to get any swim lessons? Um, he's getting them for me right now because okay. I taught swim lessons for six years. So okay, so we're coming down to fact you about me. There you go. I freaked uh, out. He, he loves the water. He's today we were walking around and he was up to his chest just standing in the water and he's perfectly fine with it he trying to stick his face in that may or may not be a good thing but at least he's not afraid of it i freaked out because my none of neither one of my kids have swim lessons and they were in a pool last week and they had their swimmers on and my oldest wanted to swim to the deep end and i freaked out because he had that thing that goes around his chest that also hooks to his arms so he mm -hmm. could swim the out puddle there jumpers or yeah. whatever but I was terrified the whole time because in my mind, he was going to slip out of it and sink to the bottom of the pool. Oh, yikes. All right. So, but guys, have you heard of that infant self rescue classes that they do for I my, my friends did it with their daughter and she at 10 months old, they could throw her in the water and she would turn over and float. What? Yes. That, see, I've seen the videos of that and that scares me beyond anything I have ever seen in my life. I would love to do it for my child, though, even though it would make me nervous. Ugh, I am terrified of that. Because it means they would be safe if they fell into water that was too deep. Yeah, well, it still makes me terrified. But guys, guess what? Uh, while you guys were West philadelphia and kentucky it up, I drove 14 hours to Disney World. So, yay, we're going to make this one quick so I can go and enjoy the park. Sweet. Awesome. <laughs> 
coming up on today's episode. We're going to talk a little bit about an adorable video with a dad and his infant son and why that should have you doing a double take with your speech therapy. Also, I talked to Melissa Knight from Rolling With Magic. Uh, it's her blog about how to uh, traverse Disney World with a disability. Also, why does the diagnosis of the right dementia matter in therapy? But we'll start off with an article out of the Asha Wire. Uh, this is coming from the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology by Adrian Hancock and Gregory Haskins. Speech language pathologist knowledge and attitudes regarding lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ uh, populations. Uh, this kind of sparked my interest because I don't know if you guys saw it last week or two weeks ago. Uh, there was a post on a Facebook group that was an SLP questioning if they could do therapy on somebody if they do not believe uh, in that person's sexuality. And this art, this this research article uh, talks about a need to promote the LGBT cultural cultural competence within the field of SLPs. Yeah, this is definitely uh, definitely an appropriate article for I, I believe it's Pride Month. I believe is that correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a, this is a good thing to to discuss. Um, really trying to see exactly what the research showed here. Um, it seems to summarize that there's a need for more mm -hmm. awareness among speech language pathologists to what they call cultural competence when it comes to LGBTQ communities. Yeah, they were asked to indicate priority of 10 LGBTQ topics for a continuing education seminar. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they were all near 50% uh, on their accuracy, I guess you could say, uh, on identifying cultural competencies. Um, our field is say across four countries. And I was curious, mm -hmm. did either of you see which countries they surveyed? I did not. Okay. I haven't seen it. I couldn't find it. Uh, let's see. I did not catch that part. I saw it was, uh, I saw it was sponsored by the university of Iowa. So I assume oh, here it was we go. US. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. 77.8% yeah. of the United States. Hey. So all the all the English speaking ones. Mm -hmm. Fair okay. enough. Well, I mean, our field is growing, growing large and our field that we're working in changes daily. And I know a couple SLPs who work uh, in areas where they work with and, and I don't know the appropriate term, transgendered men and women, uh, getting them to use either female or male uh, language structures and, and uh, tone and, and output uh, for people in their transitioning period. And, and they do therapy for, for those, those adults and they are loving it. Well, and you mentioned the discussion on the Facebook group, mm -hmm. Matt. Mm -hmm. Yes. My, what that made me think was that there could be many reasons why a patient or a therapist might decide that they're not the best fit to work together this may be one of them that would be my thought at least and if that's the case then you refer to someone else would be my thought if that's really something that you can't work with for whatever reason then um i think you should direct them to someone who's going to be the best therapist for them that's fair i mean i i've questioned sometimes seeing speech th or seeing a patient because uh, they disagreed with me on everything I've ever done. Um, and and it's difficult as a therapist to try to stay neutral. But I couldn't see being a, a patient with a therapist that doesn't like me for who I am either. And, mm -hmm. and that would be, that would be patient, difficult. Yeah. yeah. Now, granted, if you're in an acute sort of setting, or a school you just need to treat the person for what that acute need is, I think that's different than if you're getting a private therapy or they're, this is an elective service that they're receiving in some way. So in an acute setting, you, you may very well not have any idea what their um, orientation or any other religious affiliation or any other um, you know, Fair. description is. But does that mean they get, sorry, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just asking this question. If you work in the schools, do you even get a choice then at that point? I mean, in the schools, you've got to you've got to treat the kids on your caseload. Right. That's what I mean. Like, 
you can't say I can't serve this person. Right. I, and that's why I was curious if this discussion on Facebook that you talked about, were they talking about someone coming to them as an adult electively or she deleted her post. Oh, uh, okay. So I got to read the aftermath on a hidden SLP Facebook group. And okay, they were so basically, they were, they were putting her through the watching machine uh, of, of why, what she was saying, I believe it was a school district. Uh, what she was saying was basically unethical because she was refusing to treat a, pay, a student because she didn't believe uh, in their sexuality uh, orientation. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, pretty much when you think of uh, speech therapy research, uh, this is not really the first thing that comes to mind. But mm -hmm. obviously, from the from the the topics that we brought up tonight on 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 serving and everything else, I think it's very clear why Asha use their time and effort to, to research these things. Uh, here is a comment from the discussion. It says respondents held slightly more negative feelings towards transgender individuals compared to individuals who are gay, lesbian, or bisexuals. These differences in feelings may stem from societal gender norms and lack of knowledge related to the transgender population. I think that's pretty, that's probably pretty standard for overall populations. I would probably say just due to the lack of education and mm -hmm knowledge just just like you just said uh unfortunately we're just not there yet probably the majority of people but uh but yeah it's a this is an, an incredibly interesting research article i once uh i i once i still know uh, i know a person who transitioned from male to female and the hardest thing that i had to deal with from that was remembering to use the appropriate pronoun and their new name and, and the, my problem was, is I knew him for about two years as male, and then they transitioned into female. And that first six months was difficult because I kept inadvertently referring to them as their male name and male pronoun. And, and it wasn't disrespect. It wasn't a lack of cultural knowledge. It was just me being a overstressed, completely stupid moron who couldn't remember what a person's name was. And well, is that something I've seen, I've, I've filled out medical forms now at a new clinic or a new doctor that I've gone to see where I mark my preferred pronoun. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something our field should look at doing? I, I have a spot on my get to know you student checklist that I have, and it talks about what would you like to be called? And I've had students on there before reference different names, either Ge either that match their gender or did not match their gender and that usually sparks a conversation so like if their name is john smith and they put down that they want to be known as jane uh, that's my time to op my opportunity to find out uh, what their thought is but i like that idea i might actually just kind of put a little checkbox at the bottom of my my get to know you sheet just to make that feel more open to them not a bad idea now, Michael, your private practice, so I'm, I'm putting you on the, the spotlight here for, for just a moment. Have you ever worked with any uh, transgendered population for voice output, or can you say or no? Or? Uh, I have not, okay. and if, if that ever came to me, I would certainly refer out simply because that's just not my specialty. Oh, that's just, sure. I, I have no experience with that whatsoever. I, I was reading an article a couple years ago um, – this was when I was still working in the school district in Dayton, but there was an SLP who opened up a private practice in New York and she was serving only transgender populations. And it was the most interesting read. I'll see if I can find it and link it into the show notes. But basically it was teaching males how to, or biological males transitioning to female, the, the body posture and the uh, tone of voice for female and the vice versa for female to male. And she said that she was always she was full for the next eight months uh, because she was the only person in that part of New York uh, offering that kind of service. Oh, Michelle, you're muted. I coughed and muted myself. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I said something really wonderful and you missed it. Oh no! Um, just kidding. But to follow up on yours, Matt, I w I would love to to read that article. So thanks for linking. And then yeah, um, I also was looking a little bit further through this full research article and some of the questions they ask. And one a lot of it was just on on general knowledge. 
self-rated and then stereotype adherence, it seems, based on how you answer questions. And one of the questions they asked, and I, I really want to hear from some listeners, um, because I don't remember other than it being mentioned that you could potentially do voice therapy um, with someone transgender or, and mm-hmm. most of that would be elective, right? Like seeking yeah. out a private therapy service. Other than that, I don't remember that ever being touched on in grad school. And I'm, I'm curious other people's experience. Yeah. Michelle, we had the same classes. I don't remember it either. Mike. Nope. Not at all. I had a parent once tell me that she thought her son was, uh, was gay and wanted me to fix their, his voice because of that. Wow. Yeah. And I just said, I, I can't like, there's no academic impact. There's no adverse academic impact on it. No. And we worked a little bit on code switching, like when to use a like more authoritative voice versus more of our natural voice. And, you know, inadvert like we, we touched on that a little bit, but I wasn't changing that kid's voice for any reason other than what I would do with a normal pragmatic kid of talking about like, okay, this is how we talk with our friends. But when we're talking to a boss, Maybe we want to sound a little bit more uh, authoritative. Yeah, even in private practice, I would not work right? on that. Right? No. Yeah, that's not Ugh. that's not what we do. Took everything in my willpower not to throat punch that mom. <laughs> throat punch. Throat you gotta, punch. Give you, gotta you mean, vocal damage. You got a mean throat punch, dude. Ugh, I'm kidding. I would never hurt a fly. But we do want to hear from you. What are your uh, your history of working with uh, a voice population, or, or what does this study mean to you? Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. You can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com, or hit us up on the phone numbers, 614-681-1798. You can text or call 614 681 one seven nine eight and if they are a social media user speech science pc on twitter and someone tell them what it is on instagram hashtag ss pod and speech underscore science is our instagram name michelle you were supposed to sign us up with a snapchat did you do that uh no but i'm uh, working on my social media expert sister-in-law to help me out there with that. we go we could do the speech science snapchat we could share clock drawings and weird vocal cord things that happen like they do on the uh, SLPs at large Facebook group. I think we need to start doing the Instagram stories because that can have some of the live video clips as well. I don't even know what that means. Uh, Kind of Snapchatty, but on Instagram. (laughs) Ah, okay. All right. Our next article coming out of NPR. uh, Is it Alzheimer's or another dementia? The right answer uh, matters. How familiar are you guys with dementia and dementia therapy? Not really too familiar at all. I've done some PRN, home health, and SNF, but um, it's not my specialty area. Okay. Well, uh, basically, the way I explain it to my patients is that there's two types of dementia. There is progressive dementia, the dementia that gets worse. uh, And right now, current therapy and evidence, uh, from what I know, does not show that what we do can stop or reverse the tide of progressive dementia. That would be your Alzheimer's, Lewy body syndrome, et cetera. Uh, but then there are the, what I call like the normal or the typical dementias, and they can be caused by Parkinson's. They can be caused, oh, not Parkinson's, I'm sorry, a stroke, the vascular dementia, uh, the traumatic brain injury, um, alcohol or drug abuse. Um, and those are the dementias that have evidence behind them that do show that in some cases, speech therapy can reverse the tide of memory loss. So how do you know, maybe this is a silly question, Mm -hmm. how do you know which type of dementia it is? Uh, From what I understand, it is a uh, autopsy after death. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought Mm -hmm. it was a postmortem thing. So that is the hardest conversation that I have with, with my patients is that I have to explain like why we're ending therapy and their family member is getting worse um, or why we're ending therapy and they're getting better. Uh, I try to explain it at the beginning that there are two types and that um, the, the biggest tell for me as a home care therapist is that if they don't know where they live and don't know how old they are 
or how old their kids are, it mo it may be a progressive dementia. But if they're having trouble with memory loss, like, you know, forgetting where they put the coffee cup or where they parked their car or word finding issues, it may be the more typical dementia. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so the let's see, looking at the article, it says the most common are vascular dementia which are caused by stroke or blood vessels that takes up to 10 percent of all dementia cases lewy body syndrome which is related to parkinson's uh is 10 percent and frontal temporal low low bar degeneration which affects brains of the bra areas of the brain involved in personality language behavior accounts for less than 10 percent of dementia uh, cases um i also use the word cancer when i explain dementia and i explain to patients that when somebody says they have cancer uh, it could be just a little piece of skin cancer on the back of their ear because they've been uh, baking in the sun for 90 years, or it could be pancreatic cancer. But cancer is cancer, and we should treat it. But there are, you know, if I was told I have skin cancer on the back of my ear, I would not uh, freak out as much as, you know, Alex Trebek getting, or not Alex Trebek, yeah, Alex Trebek getting uh, pancreatic cancer. You have a lot more experience with explaining this to people than I do, Matt. So you I'm certainly I'm do interested in hearing from you, but I also want to hear from listeners. There you go. There you go. Give us your input. I want to uh, hashtag SS pod. Tell us about how do you describe dementia yeah. uh, to your patients and well, what are those conversations look like? And one of the big things that, that I've noticed with dementia is, and I'm going to a couple different um, presentations on it is that the increase of falls uh, are increased or the fall increase goes up with dementia because a lot of times our patients don't know what they should be doing, but they feel like they need to fill that void. So they just kind of stand up and start walking around the room trying to find something that sparks their memory. So it's that idea of um, like you walk into a room and go, I don't remember why I walked in here. So you kind of just walk the room trying to hope that it sparks your memory and then you see your computer and go, Oh yeah, I need to print out directions. It's that same idea, except they just kind of wandered their houses. That reminds me of, I remember hearing um, of some of the more fam family type setup uh, retirement and nursing mm -hmm. homes for individuals with dementia and Alzheimer's and the honeycomb kind of setup. Oh yeah. You heard of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they had was basically a big cabinet with a bunch of drawers and objects in it especially ah. things from uh you know so when they're searching for something and they don't know what they're looking for it gives them something they can sift through and find something i love that that sounds so cool it was a neat concept huh fair mm -hmm. enough um the other way that i describe memory is that it takes like an emotion link to it um, and I think that kind of helps patients as well. When I say that, like, when we remember somebody, we don't really remember all the exact details of that person, but we remember the way they made us feel or maybe the way something smelled. Um, you know, if you think about if you have a grandparent or a great grandparent that passed away, you may not remember exactly the color of their hair, or the, the dimple on their chin, but you remember the smell of their coffee in the morning or, uh, the way they made you feel when, when they gave you a big hug. So that kind of helps as well. That's a great way to describe That's it. really good. I like that a lot. Right? You can steal that. Totally steal that. I already have. Okay, good. But we do want to hear from you, like Michelle said. Hover, head, hover. You could hover your mouse over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Nice recovery on that thanks. one. Thanks. I'm a professional, guys. Or head, you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Give us a phone call, 614-681-1798. You can also text 614-681-1798. And Michael, if they are on social media, what is that hashtag that you are personally monitoring? Hashtag SSPod. I, I will say, I've said this a couple weeks ago, you guys are rocking social media because I'll get something on Facebook and it's like, your post. And I was like, I, we haven't, oh, hey. You guys are doing something. That's awesome. Hey, it's all about the fans. The fans have been great. All the listeners out there have been uh, have been reaching out to us and sending us messages. It's been awesome. Hey, we love it. We also want you to rate and review us, hopefully five stars. But if you give us a one star, eh, explain it. I won't like it, but I'll accept it. 
I like learn five from star it. Star. Hey, coming up right after the break, Melissa Knight from Rolling with Magic. Uh, Melissa is a blogger and Disney park enthusiast who visits Walt Disney World multiple times a year. She's my hero. Uh, she started a blog to share her experience as a wheelchair user, and she will discuss uh, how to traverse Disney uh, with a disability. That's coming up right after this. You're listening to Speech Science. <laughs> Do you have an idea for a product or book? Or are you ready to go beyond in-service presentations? Well, how do you get started? And what if you don't have any business experience at all? Well, I have some great news for you. I'm Mailing Chan, and I'm getting the nitty-gritty stories from parents, teachers, therapists, advocates, and people with disabilities who have created successful businesses, and they're sharing their intimate stories with you. Listen to us on the Exceptional Leaders Podcast and fast track creating and building and sharing your idea with the world so that you can help more people. Welcome back to Speech Science. I'm Matt Hot, joined today by Melissa Knight from Rolling with the Magic. Melissa is a blogger and Disney parks enthusiast who visits Walt Disney World several times a year. Melissa started her blog to share her experience as a wheelchair user and loves showing people that the parks are for everyone. Melissa, I am so glad you're here because there's one thing that I love more than my kids, and that has to be Disney. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about Disney. I, so you go several times a year. First off, are you in Florida? Or are you near Florida? Or, or what's up with that? I live in Georgia, so okay. we're near Florida, um, but we are annual pass holders, so we go quite a bit. <laughs> We just made that jump this year into the annual pass holder. Oh, we're, welcome. <laughs> we were going to go twice. And then I looked at my wife and I said, well, we bought passes. We might as well go like four times in a 12 month calendar span. That, and that's how it starts. <laughs> right? Now, are you like a Disney vacation club member or anything like that? No, we just uh, love going to the parks. And so we started going so often we're like AP's seem to be the way to go and <laughs> so they didn't get your hooks in yet with the welcome home dvc members right not quite yet we have gone to the presentation but we haven't gone all in yet <laughs> my wife and i we went and my wife looks at me to say no when she's excited mm -hmm. and i look to her to say no when i'm excited yep. and evidently we both got excited because we've been dvc members for too long now awesome <laughs> so You've been going to Disney. How long have you been going to Disney? I've been going since I think my earliest visit was maybe at like five or six in the early 80s. So, I mean, I've been going for ever, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> what is your, what do you do when you first get to Disney? Or do you, what's your first go-to ride? Um, typically it's the Haunted Mansion yeah. at Magic Kingdom. Uh, that's my favorite attraction and tends to be the one that we had to first. <laughs> I love that ride. They gave my son, uh, the keeper pass or whatever that is so that he oh, wouldn't be yeah. afraid of the ghosts. But, oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then you also, not to bury the lead, I guess, are also a, a wheelchair user, correct? I am. I am. How long have you been in a wheelchair? I've been in a wheelchair um, since I think of 2003. I was born with spina bifida, but I walked with forearm crutches for a really long time. And then it was just time to start using a chair then. So I'm a full-time wheelchair user now. And is that about the time you started the blog Wheeling, uh, Rolling with the Magic? I almost said it wrong. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. It was a couple of years later. My sister was actually like, you know, why don't you start a blog? I think, you know, it'd be a great thing that people would be interested in. So thanks to her, that's what I started doing. So the reason I had Melissa on, the reason I have you on is because I work with families who a lot of times say, I can't take my son or daughter to Disney. I can't take my father to Disney because he's in a chair and mm -hmm. I can't move around the park. He's in a chair. So that's why you're on here. So let's talk okay. a little bit about that from the from the beginning to the end. Do we look at Disney transportation? Do we look at the hotel rooms? How do you start that conversation with a family that says, I, I can't bring anyone to Disney, they're in a chair? I think the first thing I usually say to talk to people about is there's a lot of like worries when you're traveling in a wheelchair or with somebody in a wheelchair. 
And I tell them that when I go to Walt Disney World, those worries are just not there. They're just not. Everything is taken care of. I know the buses are going to be accessible. I know the hotel rooms are going to have a shower that I can use. I know the parks are going to be, well, depending on how busy they are, (laughs) so easy to get around. There's curb cutouts. There's, you know, walkways that are wide enough to get around in. And so I just tell people, you know, they're really, there's some things you're going to have to worry about. There's a little bit of stress as far as like the logistic goes with fast passes and getting on attractions, but the overall worries that you have traveling just kind of melt away when you're there. Now, has it gotten easier over the last couple of years or has Disney always been accessible? Um, I think they've gotten better. Um, A lot of the older attractions are a little bit harder um, to get on to. Uh, There's still a few that like uh, the entire queue isn't accessible. So you have to use an alternate entrance. But as things got newer, things got better. And so for the most part these days, um, things are great. What is your favorite hotel to use or what have which room which hotel have you found to be the best um well we've actually stayed everywhere but three resorts oh wow okay (laughs) we've been all over the place (laughs) um but i have to say uh disney's boardwalk walk disney's boardwalk resort is actually our favorite i just love the theming there You can roll to two parks. You don't even have to get on any transportation. (laughs) Where's Boardwalk located? It's located um, behind Epcot. Oh, yeah. Get to it through the little international gateway um, there in the back. So you can walk right into Epcot. It's a little bit of a longer walk to Disney's Hollywood Studios, but um, it's we like doing it. It's a nice walk. I, I was reading your most recent post about is that pop century that just was rehabbed or re, yes. refurbished or whatever. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that just never popped into my mind, and you mentioned how uh, the Disney soap, the one was just a little bit too far right. to reach for. That's something I've never actually even thought about for the the hotel. Do you find that kind of in every room or is that just kind of the pop century one or? That's. That's kind of something new that they've just started doing where usually they left um, toiletries just on the sink. Um, But My my bathroom is filled with those, by the way. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) But they've just started with the reusable ones. I've only seen them at the value resorts. Mm. I don't know if they've started at Moderate and Deluxe. But I have heard that um, if it's too difficult for you to get to, you can ask and they do have a few toiletries on hand that they can just give you. Oh. So you don't have to worry about trying to reach for it. That's awesome. So, so yeah, just when in doubt, ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you said that when and this interview, we're going to jump all over the place. And yeah. people that listen to the show know that I have a tendency <laughs> to trail off on different ideas. You You talked about, and it's been in my brain since you said it, when you go down to Disney, everything kind of floats away. Mm-hmm. Are are most of the staff trained to handle uh, wheelchair users or, or, you know, accessibility? Or do you have to wait for someone to come help? Or how does that all work? Um, if pretty, you need help. Yeah, pretty much. I think everybody um, is trained. And I think there's so many wheelchair users that visit that they kind of just get used to it. And when you ask a question, most of the time, the first cast member that you talk to has an answer for you, right? which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I was actually just reading a thing the other day. They said cast members are not allowed to say, I don't know anymore. Right. Yeah. So I never knew that. Um, talking about hotels and stays, is mm-hmm. there a hotel that you would, you would maybe say to cha- wheelchair users, maybe not use this one because it's beautiful, but not very accessible or? The only hotel I tend to tell people to maybe steer away from is um, Port Orleans Riverside, Mm. just because it's so big. 
Um, it's a gorgeous resort. I love it over there. And if you pay for a preferred room or one of their princess rooms, you tend to be closer to the main parts of the resort. But any resort like that one or Caribbean Beach that has an internal bus system tends to be a little harder to navigate <laughs> because it's so big. And sometimes we've had where we're waiting at the bus stop for our building and then the bus gets there and they've already got a wheelchair and a scooter on board. So it's basically full. So we have to then wait for the next bus. But um, that's really the only reason not to stay there. The rooms are great. It's just it's just so big. <laughs> I believe that I we stayed at Old Key West a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I looked at each other like, oh, we'll just walk to the front. It's fine. You know, the bus was full. And I think it was a 20 minute walk. And at the end, we were both like, never again. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> We were pushing a stroller with a two-year-old in it. And we were like, this is the worst thing we've ever done. Yeah, yeah. So I would just definitely check on the size of the resort and maybe take that into consideration before you pick one. <laughs> how, how are the size rooms for wheelchair? Like, is it able? I saw in the one post you said that if you have two people in the chair, it may be a little cramped. Is that a pretty typical thing? Um, deluxe rooms are, of course, a lot bigger. I haven't run into that problem there. Um, moderates are pretty good. Um, Pop Century used to have a king size bed just kind of in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. But with the refurbishment, they added that Murphy bed that comes down. So it kind of slid the bed over a little bit. So that's the only one that I've really come across with that particular problem. Very cool. Now, we had mentioned Disney transportation. If anyone's never been to Disney, mm -hmm. you don't have to drive anywhere on, on site, oh, right? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but for those that are not familiar, they have Disney busing, mm -hmm. monorail. Yes. The minivan, if you want to pay for it. Yes, I've paid for that. <laughs> have you really? Okay. <laughs> and is there, there's a fourth one, and I feel like I'm forgetting the fourth one. Um, well, some of the resorts do have boats. Mm, that's it. Thanks. It. So what did you find uh, that was easiest for you and your family? Um, buses are super easy. Um, all the bus drivers are trained. Um, so it's been super easy getting on and off of all of those. I love the monorail. Um, it's just some stations are a little harder, um, like the one at the Ticket and Transportation Center. And the doors might fall off. Right. That's <laughs> <how it's> <laughs> <laughs> but some of the ramps to get to some of the stations can be a little steep. Okay. Um, so when you're trying to get to the Magic Kingdom, it can be, I tend to use the ferry just because it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, but the Epcot monorail station does have an elevator, so you don't have to go oh. up all the ramps, which is nice. And it's hidden, so it's not very, you, you won't really have to wait for it because most people don't even know it's there. I was going to say, I don't even know where the monorail station is. I know the monorail crosses across Epcot. Where's the... Where's the station? It's just outside the gates, mm -hmm. um, kind of where the tram picks up people to go back to the parking lot. Um, and then the you go up one ramp, and then the elevator's just back behind it. Oh. So it's nice. Yeah. You can do that. <laughs> I, we Last time we went to Epcot, we drove because we brought our car down. And long mm -hmm. story short, I ended up figuring out the quickest way from, is it the where the revolving restaurant is? Is that the Life Pavilion? Uh, that's the Land. Land Pavilion mm -hmm. to the parking lot and back because we forgot things three different times. So I know that entrance <laughs> fairly well, uh, not from the monorail standpoint, but from the parking lot. Now, you said you paid for the minivan. Why'd you do that? Was it worth it? It was just kind of to try it out because we'd oh. never really done it before. But they do, um, you have to call in. Um, usually, typically, you can reserve them using the Lyft app. And we've used the non-accessible one. My husband's just kind of picked me up and helped me get into it. Uh, but if you call the service, they do have a bigger van with a lift on it, oh. which is really nice. And it just can be convenient if you're going to a resort, like from resort to resort, since there's no transportation to get to a character meal or something like that. It's just, you know, 
fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It's just kind of fun. <laughs> you and my wife, you and my wife, my wife sees it and she's like, oh, we need to take that. And I'm like, there is no way on earth I am riding in a van, a minivan. <laughs> But it's so cute, and they usually play Disney music while you're in there, and the cast members are, you know, Disney employees, <laughs> so they're really nice. <laughs> yeah, she's convinced my boys that we all need to take a ride in the minivan when we go in June, so I have a feeling I've already lost that battle well yeah. before I'm there. I think you should give it a try. I'm with her on this one. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about the hotels. We talked a little bit about transportation. Let's talk about the fun part, the parks. Yes. What is, we'll start off on the negative and we'll work on the, the positives. Okay. What do you think is the, the biggest block or, you know, impediment about having a wheelchair at any of the parks? Um, it's just when it's really crowded, it just, it, it can be hard. Um, right. Just, I mean, just trying to get through a mass of people can be kind of difficult. Um, people will walk right out in front of you because I mean, really it's, it's not that they mean to do it. It's just, there's so much people are looking at or they're in their map trying to figure out where they're going or they're looking at their app, trying to figure out where to head to the next fast pass. So you just got to be really aware of your surroundings. So you don't run over somebody basically. <laughs> now, are you in a motorized one or a, a propelled one? I have a manual and an electric one. Um, so uh, it it's not really, I wouldn't say it's easier or harder with either one of them. You just kind of have to be aware of what's happening around you so you don't accidentally hit somebody's foot. That's fair. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so I'm guessing my attitude with the stroller is probably not yours where I go, well, if they get hit, they get hit. <laughs> well, I figure mine, if I'm in my electric chair, it might be a little bit more of an injury than getting hit with a stroller. So <laughs> now I, this is a, I, I actually don't know the answer to this question. So I know, and, and I apologize if I keep relating stroller to wheelchair, cause that's my only oh, yeah, frame yeah, of yeah. reference. I noticed at the at at Magic Kingdom, for example, mm -hmm. they have those trolley tracks in the middle of the road. Yes. And I always have to make sure that I am really paying attention if I have to cross over those. Is is most of the chairs able to cross that, or is that kind of another one of those things where you just have to pick your kinda, place to change? Yeah, um, it's easiest definitely if you kind of use the sidewalks on the side to just avoid it entirely um but you do kind of have to like pop a little bit of a wheelie not like a huge one but just a little bit so the like the little front tire doesn't get caught in there because i've had that happen before but um it's not in my electric chair i hadn't had a problem but yeah you just kind of have to be aware that they're there now, do you have to give any heads up to if you're going, because Disney, if you haven't been to Disney, you have to make your dinner reservation six months in advance. Right. <laughs> if you want, you know, three o'clock instead of noon, if you want noon, you better call like that 6 a.m. time or whatever. Right, exactly. <laughs> but do you need to call ahead or is it part of the reservations when you say, hey, we need an accessible uh, table or how does that work? Um, if you make the reservation online, there is a little area that you can click um, that says you're going to be in a wheelchair. That way they don't put you like in a booth or somewhere that would be really hard to get to. <laughs> and if you call in, just tell the cast member that somebody is in a wheelchair. And then typically um, they may ask if you want to stay in your chair or, um, you know, transfer to a seat most of the time when I get to the table they've already taken the chair for me which is really nice because we go to restaurants here where we live and we roll up to the table and they just kind of look at me and I'm like <laughs> can you move it <laughs> please <laughs> what do you want us to do with this chair right? <laughs> so you know they kind of just take care of it for you so you don't even really have to ask and even if you didn't mention it, once you get there, if you talk to somebody at the podium, they'll make sure you're taken care of. That is the one thing that I've noticed with Disney is that it doesn't seem to matter how bad of a day or how much you need help or, or as simple as like, hey, can you make sure the chair's not at the table? Like right. those cast members are on it down there. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're ready and willing to help. <laughs> now, do you go to any other amusement parks? 
Not really. No. Not really. <laughs> we have uh, Cedar Cedar Fair's Kings Island right up here. Uh-huh. In, I'm, I'm from Cincinnati. Okay. And I used to love Kings Island, and I still do. It's my home park. But I compare a lot of it to what would Disney do? <laughs> right. And it's like, <laughs> come on, guys. Like, I was just at Disney, and Disney made my trash into a shape of Mickey before they picked it up. <laughs> and your trash can has bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Probably why we never really go anywhere else. <laughs> so we, we touched on it when I asked you what your favorite ride was, was uh, Haunted Mansion. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the rides, there's always a fast pass. I know that Toy Story Mania at Hollywood Studios has an accessible unit. Does, mm-hmm. I, I don't even, ride vehicle, I guess. I don't even know how to call it that. Yeah, they call them ride vehicles. Does every ride at Disney have like an accessible chair, like an accessible vehicle, or can you ride the regular ones? How does that work with a wheelchair user? Um, some, they, if you pick up a park map, which I always suggest people do, um, they have one uh, just for guests with disabilities and they have oh. um, different tiers of attractions to where, well, it tells you whether you don't have to transfer or whether you do have to transfer, but there's an accessible ride vehicle. So, for example, Slinky Dog, I do have to transfer, but the back row has a, the side folds down and basically creates like a little bench. You sit on that, then transfer in, and then they fold that back up. So it's pretty easy to get into because it's the same height as most wheelchairs. And then things like um, the Little Mermaid, Toy Story Mania, um, the Jungle Cruise, you can just stay in your chair. Which one do you prefer? Do you like transferring into the ride vehicle or do you like you staying in your chair or does it kind of matter <laughs> or does it or does it mean on the whichever ride you're using? Yeah, it's it's definitely easier to be able to stay in my chair. Sometimes when we go, I'm like, I just don't feel like transferring today (laughs) so we only just do like a few things that are just easier but um a lot like expedition everest like that one's actually really easy to get into because it has it's kind of like slinky dog too where the side of it opens up and you know and sometimes you just really want to ride a thrill ride (laughs) and i'm guessing if you're riding a thrill ride you don't want your chair strapped in no 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 (laughs) And really, one of the easier rides is Flight of Passage in really? Pandora because they came up with a special chair, wheelchair that you transfer into, and you take that up into the ride vehicle, and they have a little pump on the back of it, so it pumps it up so you're at the exact height as the little ride vehicle, and you basically just have to scoot forward, wow. and then, you know, you're in it. and. I, I found it to be super easy. I wasn't expecting it to be as easy as it was. And I couldn't believe that they came up with the wheelchair to make it that easy. And I love that attraction too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I have never, I have never rode Flight of Passage yet. We have, like I said, I have a five and a two-year-old. We rode the Navi River Adventure or whatever it's right. called. But we have not rode Flight of Passage yet. Yeah, Flight of, I, I, I cried the first time I Did wrote really? it. I'm not, I'm not even lying about that. It's just, it felt very freeing as somebody, you know, in a wheelchair all the time. You get on it, you feel like you're flying, the banshee, you can feel it breathing. And I mean, it's just, it's so much fun. I mean, I know a lot of people don't like it as much as I like it, but I really, really love that attraction. That's awesome. Now, did you get the same feeling from, um, you're gonna kill me. The ride at Epcot, Soren. Did Soarin'. you get the same feeling from Soren or? Um, not not quite as much. I mean, it's still fun. Uh, but there's something about Flight of Passage, the way it just banks and you just really feel like you're moving. And I don't really get that feeling of movement, you know, in my everyday life. So it's just it's so much fun. That's pretty awesome. I've I, I we're riding it this summer. I don't know oh. if it's the June trip or the September trip. Well, I don't mean to hype it up too much, but I love it. <laughs> too late. You've already done it. I will be sorely disappointed if, you send it to a Facebook if it doesn't le- re- uh, live up to the hype. <laughs> One of the things I notice at the park is how much Disney does to 
accommodate every single guest. Right. When you go there, do you feel, and again, this is because we're talking about parents or families that don't know if they can bring their family member in a wheelchair. Do you feel like it's a bigger hassle or do you feel like Disney's just like, Hey, no big deal. Yeah. I feel like it's just no big deal. Um, I tell you, like, one of the main things, like, when we travel, I know, and a lot of people have to worry about it, is, like, restrooms. Mm -hmm. And there are family and companion restrooms all over the place in the parks. Like, you don't even have to hunt them down. They're just there. And then if you need, uh, you know, somewhere to lay somebody down or a little bit extra space, you just go to first aid and they don't even question you. You just come in and say, Hey, I need some extra space to use the restroom. And they're like, sure, come on in. And they just take you to a room and it's just like, it's air conditioned. It's private and it's, it's not a big deal. And I know when I've gone other places and I've asked questions, people will look at me like I'm kind of crazy. Like they just don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But at Disney, it's completely different. Like everybody's just so helpful. I really like the pa the the passage, the post you had on quiet spaces at Disney. Mm -hmm. Are all those wheelchair accessible as well? Then yes. Uh, for those that are not that don't know what I'm talking about, it is on the RollingWithMagicBlog.com. But you go into detail about you know some really nice places that are just easy to just relax, catch your breath. Right. regroup and then get back into the Disney magic. Where's your favorite quiet spot? Oh, geez. My favorite or do you not want to tell anybody <laughs> and then just tell us your least tell favorite Tell everybody, one. then they'll all go there. <laughs> I will tell you, I'll tell you mine. And then while you can, maybe, okay. it's not even really a quiet spot, but it's the, um, oh, it's in Avatar and it is located just on the other side of those magic drums. You know what I'm oh, talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with a five and a two year old, it was nice because they could kind of stretch their legs. Yeah. The music wasn't, the drums wasn't right in our ears, but it was, there was nobody there because there's no lines for anything. They just kind of. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's nice. There's a, the pathway, it's kind of like the second entrance exit to Pandora, where you go between there and Harambe in Africa. Back there, there's usually not that many people. So sitting back there is really nice, too. Speaking of, how do you, have you, how do you do the, uh, the, the tour, the, the animal tour? I can't even think of what the word is called in Animal oh, Kilimanjaro Safari. Yeah, Kilimanjaro Safari. Um, you can actually stay in your wheelchair and do oh. that one. Um, there's a separate loading dock for people in wheelchairs. Um, and it's also the spot where, like, if you're in a scooter and you can still step into the ride vehicle, you kind of go over there, too. Um, but there's a spot in the front, and I think about four people could fit next to you. Mm -hmm more people can sit right behind you and they just strap you in <laughs> um, <laughs> they've got some really good strong straps so you don't like fly out of the thing but um and then you're just off and it's it's one of my favorites too because it's easy to do you don't have to get out of your chair you get to go see some giraffes it's nice <laughs> now I, I i have to ask this question if you don't want to answer it you can say matt shut up <laughs> when i'm riding kilimanjaro I'm afraid I'm going to be bouncing out of the chair, <laughs> or out of the bench. It's like a hard plastic bench. And if no one's ridden Kilimanjaro that's listening to this one, shame on you. Go to Disney, ride Kilimanjaro. <laughs> but the best I could explain it is if you've ever ridden in the back of like a, a, a tractor, like mm -hmm. at a, like at a pumpkin patch, and right. the tractor's doing 40 miles an hour through the ruts of the field. That is what it feels like. <laughs> It I, is bumpy. It is very bumpy. I can't imagine what that's like with uh, with the chair. I'll say my chair doesn't move. Uh, they got two straps that tie it down in the back, two in the front. And then there's a handle on either side that you can kind of hold on to if you feel like, you know, okay. you're going to fly out of it. <laughs> <laughs> like but, when you said that they just leave you, you can go in your chair. I was like, oh, I... I'm still worried about my kids just bouncing out. Like, Yeah, I don't know. It may be bumpier toward the back. I don't know. 
Now, how does that for the train at Magic Kingdom? I know Magic Kingdom's train is down right now, but do you have to transfer or can you stay in the chair there? You can stay in your chair. Um, you just sit toward the front. They've got a little ramp that will come down, and then there's a little bench that fits one, maybe two people, and then the rest of your party would then just sit right behind you. But um, we do that a lot, too, because that's kind of a good quiet spot going back to that because – you know, you take the Grand Circle tour going mm -hmm. from the Main Street Station all the way back, and there's a nice breeze if it's hot, and it's just quiet and a good way to see the park, you know, without being around quite so many people. We do that with the People Mover. I, I love doing the People Mover at night, just so you can see all the lights and everything. I miss the People Mover. I can't do that one. You can't do that one. <laughs> okay. Um, just because it doesn't stop. Uh, oh, it's the same thing with uh, Peter Pan's flight. Um, oh, I don't that one do doesn't that stop one. either. Yeah, because they're the ride vehicles are uh, constantly moving. So if you've got like a small child that you can pick up and just take with you, you can do it. But um, the one in uh, Disneyland is actually different. It does stop. So oh, I've done. It? Yeah, so I've done it at Disneyland, but I haven't done it at Walt Disney World in years. Have you been tempted to, uh, you're married, if you're okay with me mentioning that. Yes. <laughs> have, have you been tempted to tell your husband, hey, I'll hold on tight. <laughs> We're riding this. Have you been tempted for that? With the people mover? Yes. Yeah. I have have you really? <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, I haven't made him do that. No. <laughs> okay. You say that now. Let's talk in about two weeks and we'll find out what happens. When are you going back to Disney, by the way? Um, I'm not real sure. We've got a Disney cruise planned, so um, I'm not sure when we're going to get back yet. I was just saw on, on Facebook, it's at Rolling with the Magic. Did you just get back from another Disney cruise? I did. We cruise about with Disney once a year. This past year, we did twice because it was my birthday. <laughs> it was a big birthday, so we you went You don't twice. need an excuse. You're good. <laughs> Um, how is that for accessibility? Is it about the same or is that? It's great. Um, the rooms are great. They're big. The bathrooms are nice. It's easy getting around the ship. Um, they've got doors marked that are a little easier to use to get in and out of, on the deck and stuff. Um, you, the movie theaters have wheelchair seating. The theaters where you go see the shows have wheelchair seating. Um, I, I I love it just as much as the parks, maybe a little bit more <laughs> these days. <laughs> I, I saw the photo of you guys playing the uh, the Star Wars, or not playing the Star Wars chess, but at the Star Wars chess table. And that was enough for me yes. to say, okay, <laughs> I need a Disney cruise in my life. Yeah, when they let the adults in for a tour of the kids club, you, you have to go. <laughs> Wait, so, so that's just the kids club? That's not like something I can do? No, that the kids get the best stuff. Okay, really well, do. my kid's five. He needs an adult supervisor at all yeah. times, I'm but sure. They do, they do have open houses at the kids' clubs at different times during the week, so adults can go in there and see all the cool stuff. Because <laughs> they know why we're there. They really do. Exactly. Now, you said Disneyland. Have you been to any other Disney park, Shanghai or Paris or... It's on our bucket list, so hopefully we'll get there soon, but Disneyland is the only other one that we've been to so far. Which park would you say is the most accessible friendly between like Disneyland, California Great Adventure, the four world parks? Um, oh, man. Or maybe which one gives you the least amount of anxiety or stress about <laughs> planning? Um, I would, I guess I would have to say, um, Animal Kingdom at this point, just because it's the newest. So everything there is just, other than the bumpy, 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 bumpy walkway. <laughs> I just want to emphasize that they are bumpy. <laughs> yes. Um, every, you know, the pathways are pretty wide. There's lots of attractions you can do. It's a lot of fun. I, it's just, I don't know. It depends on my mood, really. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, did you like the Toy Story Land edition? I like it. I wish there was a little bit more shade, like most people do. Um, but you can, I mean, you can stay in your wheelchair to do Toy Story Mania. Uh, Slinky Dog has the accessible car. There's an accessible car for the alien swirling saucers. So it's all pretty accessible. 
It's just you, hot back there. I was going to say, we went back there and it was like no trees. And I just was like, are you, what's going on? And someone's like, oh, in about 10 years, it'll be nice and shaded when the trees grow in. I'm like, it doesn't help me now. Yeah, it's it's a little hot. <laughs> are, are, are you looking to, uh, are you looking forward to Star Wars land? Oh, I cannot wait. I, <laughs> I'm a big old nerd. So. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I I can't wait. I've been like consuming every little bit of information that I can possibly get um, about it, and I it just seems like it's going to be so much fun. I'm debating if we need to buy a lightsaber as a family or three lightsabers, one for each boy and myself, <laughs> and one family droid or three family droids. Uh, have you seen those that they're building those? I I am buying a droid. Right? For, for sure. <laughs> like, I cannot wait to do that. I I, I told my, my husband wants a lightsaber, and I'm like, it's not that I want one. It's just I want to go through the experience of creating it, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just seems like it's just going to be so much fun. So. I, I'm with you, and I read that, or I heard that the droids are going to interact with things just like at Harry Potter Land. <laughs> I, yeah, I haven't been to Harry Potter land yet. So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> do, you, do you like Harry Potter? I do like Harry Potter. We just, we haven't been to Universal yet just because we typically have annual passes and then we don't just spend the extra money to go elsewhere, you know? <laughs> I want to, I get a lot, of, I get questions about Universal a lot, so I really do need to head over there to check it out. Expense that, that'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you a personal question, so I apologize okay. if you don't like it. <laughs> that's that's the key that you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Okay. What do you want to say to people when, one, they look at you and they go, yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry, or something like that. Or what do you want to say when there is a dude that could be not in the handicap accessible part of the ride or the train and refuses to move? Um, and we are family friendly here, so <laughs> if you do need to say a curse word, I will bleep it out, so you're okay. No, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best not to. No, I, I haven't run into too many issues at the parks um fortunately um usually when it comes to like the accessible ride vehicles and things the cast members do a really good job of making sure the people that need to be there are there um they can't really say yeah i don't think you're disabled what are you doing here but they do a good job of trying to keep those spaces you know for those people the biggest problem is sometimes the restrooms mm -hmm. um people in the companion restrooms that don't i mean it's just one person they're not even in there with anybody else it's just a person or using the bigger stalls that kind of i it'll take forever sometimes just to use the restroom so i just you know please don't <laughs> use those please <laughs> leave those to the people who need them yes <laughs> Those Disney bathroom lines, man, are one of the worst waits I've ever had at the park. Yeah, they, they can be that you need a fast pass to the bathrooms <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> so you got to not only do you need to book your rides 180 or whatever <laughs> days in advance, but then you have to plan your bathroom breaks. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and you only get one in Toy Story Land. I'm sorry. That's all we can give you. Oh yeah. I, I, we don't, I haven't even tried to get in those restrooms. Oh, really? We usually just go somewhere else. <laughs> we, uh, we found out because we have the little guys, we always end up taking, because the one needs to be changed still. So we take him to mm -hmm. the nursery and then, the, or not the nursery, the baby care center, the baby care center. Yeah. Which is usually right next to the first aid. And yeah. then that's where we get our big guy. We're like, okay, just go use like a clean <laughs> child size toilet. <laughs> so yes. I don't have to hold you up <laughs> at a urinal. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I tell people to go to first aid a lot of times too, because there's really not a lot of people there. So just go in. It's air conditioned. Take your time. <laughs> Get away from the people for a little while. I appreciate your time for all this. Before we wrap up, what is the thing about Disney that brings you the most joy? It's 
I, like I said before, it's just the no worries thing. It's, you know, Hakuna Matata. <laughs> As I drink my water out of my Lion King glass. I, there, I, I'm a planner. And sometimes when you're in a wheelchair, there's just things you've got to keep planning. You're planning where your bathroom stops are. You have to research whether where you're going is actually accessible or not. Sometimes you don't know if a hotel is going to be accessible until you get there. And then it turns out it's not. And it just can be stressful. And a Disney vacation has never really been that kind of stressful. It's just regular stress like everybody else has. <laughs> regular stress with 10,000 of your other friends. Which I appreciate. I just want regular stress <laughs> sometimes, not the extra. <laughs> with 150 degree temps in Florida. like. But it's fun. It's, it's just, fun. it's fun. Like I said, I, I've been wanting to do this episode for a long time. I love Disney and I didn't know how to get Disney onto the podcast <laughs> without sounding like a lunatic. Um, what do, what would you say to a family that they've got, you know, a family member that is in a wheelchair and they just say, mm -hmm. Melissa, I heard everything you said, but I'm just super stressed because fill in any reason. What would you say to that family to, to get them to Disney? I would say um, one thing we didn't really cover was Disney has a disability access pass. Oh. And so if you go to guest services and you there's something going on other than just the wheelchair, maybe somebody can't be out in the heat for that long, or there's just something else going on. You go talk to a cast member, you get your, um, you don't have to show proof of anything. You just tell them what kind of accommodation you need and they will tell you what they can do for you. And you'll get the pass, it'll be connected to your magic band. Oh. And then you show up to a ride and they'll give you a return time. So basically you can wait in a virtual queue. And that way you could say you went to go ride the Jungle Cruise and you got a return time. Well, then you could go wait in the Tiki Room where it's nice and air conditioned. Oh, yeah. And see that, and by the time that's over, then you go back to the Jungle Cruise and ride it. So if you use that in conjunction with your fast passes, it makes things so much easier. So is that almost then like, uh, does it work similar to a fast pass then when they say your return time is 2.15 to 2.30? Typically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you just made me think about something where you said that it, if there's other comorbid, comorbid, co anyway, other things going on. <laughs> speech therapist I can't talk right now is um what would you say to somebody who says I could be in a chair but I'm going to try to walk the whole park don't because I'm too embarrassed or I'm too afraid someone's going to judge me for being into the chair um I I know some people worry about that and I, I have heard stories about people making comments about cutting lines and stuff like that and I know it's hard and you can get a little embarrassed, but it's so worth it for you. If you just get in the chair, those parks are huge. It's a lot of walking. I know I did it on my forearm crutches before and I was a stubborn 18 year old who said, <laughs> I'm not going to be in a wheelchair. I'm walking this park. And by the end of the day, I was like, may I please have a wheelchair, please. I'm, I'm, I'm so tired. <laughs> So just, you know, get in the chair and just try to focus on you and the fun that you're having and just ignore those other people. I mean, they're just hot and tired too. <laughs> <laughs> it's normal stress at that point, it's right? It's normal stress. And just, you know, make it easier on yourself and use a wheelchair, walk some when you can. Um, you know, you can still go to attractions that, you know, that say you must be ambulatory like peter pan's flight mm -hmm. you know go do that it doesn't matter you do you and have fun now is there wheelchair rental down there then they do have wheelchair rentals and uh ecv rentals if you okay. want to go that route too okay now i know recently we had to measure our double stroller to make sure our boys because I, I i agree with you 100 percent. i would tell parents if you've got a kid under the age of six bring a stroller because right 
if you want to carry your six-year-old, great, but you're going to be walking 15 miles a day with a six-year-old. Right. Get a stroller. We had to measure our stroller to make sure it fit. Is that going to, are they looking to do the same thing then with chairs? From uh, what I've heard, no. And then from what I've also heard is that say you've got an older child that needs a bigger stroller due mm -hmm. to medical issues, those are exempt from oh. the new stroller policy. Oh, good. I did not hear that. I just heard about the, what is it, 31 inches and five foot wide or long? Right, right. Yeah. So, but if you do have a bigger chair because your child needs it for some reason, they are exempt. Um, it may, you may have a little bit more trouble when the policy first rolls out because sometimes it takes a while for the cast members to understand all this, but just um, talk to somebody. It should be exempt. And then you could also get a, a tag for your chair called, that has says stroller as a wheelchair. Oh. And then that way you don't have to park your stroller. You can take it through the queue like a regular wheelchair. Oh, that's really good to know. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. that's so awesome. um, yeah, we see people doing that all the time. So it just has that little tag and then it lets the cast members know that you don't need to park it. It's going with you. Very cool. Melissa, is there anything else that I did not touch on because I did not know to ask? I think we caught it all there at the end. <laughs> awesome. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Thank you so much for having me. And welcome back to Speech Science, the Disney episode, because I'm in Disney. I'm Matt Hot, joined, as always, from Kentucky, Michelle Wintering. Hi again, Matt. And out in Philadelphia, Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? The thing that I loved about uh, the interview with her was how she talked about how a lot of times we fight disabilities and we want to try to enjoy the parks or do whatever we can without any aids and trying to be as close to able body as we can. And I loved how she said that, like, if you need a wheelchair, get a wheelchair. If you need to get that pass so that you don't have to wait in line, get the pass so you don't have to wait in line and enjoy the park. I, I love it. So that's just me. I'm all about trying to enjoy things as much as you can. Hey, come on, our feel good story tonight uh, is this video that we will link in the show notes, but I'm gonna play for you guys real quick, if I can unmute it. So I love that. That is a dad and his son. Uh, the son looks to be about nine months old, maybe a year. I would say sometime, yeah, probably nine months to a year. Some variegated babbling going on there. That was absolutely freaking adorable. <laughs> Fantastic video. All and the my, listeners need to watch the video. It's worth it. And the way that the dad was speaking to his kid and just using all those big words and talking to him like he, like he was a peer of his, that was awesome. That was really, really cool. No baby talk. That is no the best talk. part. Yep. No baby talk. Just talking to him like he's, like he's, like he's 25. Hey, there is, though, you guys, you can't say there's no use for the baby talk because the, the parentheses, what do they call it? The the term for parentees? Or oh, yeah, parentees, talk. yeah. Mother, yeah. motheries. Motheries. Yeah. Motheries, there we go. Um, is There's a place for that, too. But I love this so much because the video just shows so much eye contact and the gesturing and the turn-taking. And the kid initiates half of it, too. He's the one who turns to the dad and points to something. It's adorable. Well, and it models a lot of what we do in speech therapy. We we tell parents like, hey, you know, when you're at the store, talk to your, your son or daughter and say, do we need to get green beans? Do you want to have cake for dinner? Do we want to have fish? Because that teaches the kid the the what you do in, in social interactions. And, and what I love the most about this video was the little dude uh, mimicking the dad's body action. And you can tell the dad is always talking with his hands or somebody in that family is because the baby was talking with both hands and pointing and eye gestures and facial expressions. Uh, I love this video. It's a good one to end on. I love it. Yeah, I'm going to see if we can reach out to Shanika, Shaniki Pryor, Shaniqua Pryor. Maybe we can talk to the baby. That would be awesome. Get him on Speech Science. That would be the weirdest interview I've ever done, but it would be fun. I just, I want to bring our, our speech science kids, put your two sons on the mics. I'll bring in James. He'll oh just my babble. Gosh. 
I could call the the, the six year old in right now, but I, I don't really need to right now. So before we send this show home, Michael, what are you doing? What is exciting coming up for you in the next week or so? Uh, I'm just ready ready to do more therapy outside. I'm ready to get out there and get out in the community and uh, go into some some restaurants, some coffee shops, and uh, and really see what we can do and change things up. Do you do that very often? And when the weather's nice, I do, yeah. Do you really? That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I love it. Huh. Michelle, are you going oh. to be taking therapy patients into restaurants and coffee shops? Because now I'm jealous and want to do that. I know. I want to go do therapy with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Should. Mike, can you hire us to your private practice? <laughs> I'll, I'll, bring you on, I'll bring you on as a client. <laughs> a client, too. That'll work. That's right. My per diem is low, just so you know. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, for me, I will be finishing up in Disney and coming back. Uh, next week's episode will be a little bit late. So that's all I got to say for that. That's all right. It's summer break. Right? We have a little bit more lackadaisical. But what we don't want you to do is be lackadaisical. You help get us to number 36 in our uh podcast rankings see if you can get us to number one and to do that we need more rankings and reviews out of you so make sure you head over to itunes and rate us five stars one star it don't matter but do it and then write a little blurb about it that helps us our intro music tonight please listen carefully by jazar it's licensed under an attribution and share alike license our bump music is the county fair rock copyright a john deku you can find his music at soundcloud.com slash dirt dog music and our closing music is Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution license. And I would be remiss not to mention over on Patreon, we still have that going on. For a few lucky people, we will take you to a Disney restaurant when we go down to Asha in November. So let's go there. And you can have dinner with Michelle, Michael, and myself. Waffle House. Chef Mickey's, man. A <laughs> Chef Disney Mickey. restaurant, Mike. <laughs> Could you imagine the three of us and two or three SLP listeners and their guests all together at Chef Mickey's getting a picture with Mickey Mouse and Goofy? I'm just saying that's option out there if you go to our Patreon and, and sign up for the, the top and tier. And that picture level. will surely be hashtag SSPod. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, uh, in the immortal words of Janice Wright, be a willow in a storm. You, you will think you want to be an oak, but the oak will crack under pressure. The willow will bend and return to form. So be the willow in your life. Be the willow in your work setting. For Michael McLeod and Michelle Wintering, I'm the sunburned and enjoying Disney World, Matt Hot. And until next week, so long, everybody. Bye. Bye. This has been an Exceptional Podcast Network production. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.